this is kind of where I want to start with this. Last year, we were really, and actually for the last couple of years, the big selling point of the Marlies, as you know, should be with any type of younger team and that has a deep farm system, is like, hey, go see the stars of the future. Go see the team that's going to impact the future. And last year, the team had uh, Garrett Sparks, who was all but, you know, penned in to be the, the backup goaltender of the Leafs this year, which ended up working out. They had Andreas Janssen, who was coming off of that cameo performance in the postseason where he looked really, really good for the Leafs and had kind of clearly established himself as the next guy. And they had Hall, who you thought was going to have a spot. They, you still were able to go see Lilligren. But weirdly enough, like based on your piece, like the, the amount of spots that the Leafs appear to be likely to rely upon with the Marlies and the talent that's down there, especially on the blue line, is this not a more exciting version of the Marlies in terms of you getting a preview of what is going to be in the very near future for the Leafs? Yeah, uh, I would say it depends what you look at excitement because right now there is a lot of players um, who have opportunity. There are spots to be won. Uh, in the past, I think that may, maybe there were less players that you knew directly were going to come up, but they were going to be contributors and you knew they were going to matter uh, to the least a great deal. At this point, you can go down and see a handful of guys who you're not entirely sure if they're going to be good enough and if they're going to be there. The, the, the Leafs and Marlies are kind of at a weird position because for years, or the last few years anyway, you know, Leafs fans have probably gotten used to players getting called up, getting plugged in, and being good. I mean, being just flat out contributors that can hang. And, um, you know, that's because they've had guys like uh, Nylander, who was a superstar, and Zach Hyman, who was 24, and, um, you know, Kapanen, who is, you know, a you know, great young player, too, and um, Dermott uh, ahead of schedule. So they had some guys that were able to step in and play. Right now, they have more stereotypical AHL players. They have guys that are have potential to be very good, but they're not there yet, and the Leafs want and need them to be good in terms of the salary cap and how they're going to fill holes. But the reality is, in some cases, these guys aren't there. So, yes, to go watch them right now, it's exciting because you can kind of make up your own mind about who's ready and who you'd like to see get the, those available shots. Yeah, they're, they seem more like lottery tickets. Like you get in, in baseball when you're evaluating prospects that it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe not, but no, no sure things. And I think one of those guys that maybe embodies that is Jeremy Bracco, who, who was more than a point-of-game player during the regular season, and he's more than that in the postseason. But he's another diminutive uh, guy, 5'11", right? Second-round pick. What, yeah. what do you see from him? Well, he's, he's the most interesting person because he's a, a perfect fit, for, you know, if you just look at the raw information and not the human factors. You know, they need someone cheap. They need someone who's a right winger. Um, you know, he's young and he's put up points. And if you were just sort of going over the numbers, you'd go, wow, there's a guy you plug right in. He makes the big club and you move on. But um, it's just not the reality of where he's at as a human being. Like, I don't know about you guys, but at 21, I grew an inch and gained like 10 pounds. Like, what? I just, some people, yeah, I didn't. people just grow at different times. And Bracken was still not, uh, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, he's not a man. He's just mm. he's a young guy. And, um, you know, he doesn't have that physique. You know, I talked to a couple of people around the Marlies. He, he sits beside Colin Greening in the dressing room, who Colin Greening is like carved out of absolute granite and 6'3 and just this monster dude. And Bracco sits beside him like, well, well you know, it's my turn next, guys. <laughs> like, he just doesn't look the part. You're not sure he's ever going to be uh, big enough to be your physical enough to handle the rigors of the NHL. I understand that the game is changing and the way it's played is, is moving in a more skilled direction. But if you can't get to where you need to go to make your skilly little plays, uh, you're never going to be very effective. So Brack is a guy who his size and strength is, is going to come into play. It's a big summer for him. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, you, you just hit on everything here, which is a couple of things. One, no, we all agree. Let's all just do the thing, the preface that we all have to do every single time we talk about hockey players now, which is, Yes, skill. We value skill. Skill is the most important thing. You have to be able to play. You have to be able to make plays. And clearly, Jeremy Bracco has elite vision. Like, that's not a, that, that's not a coincidence, the, the numbers that he's put up this year. It's not a fluke anyways. But, right. yeah, man, he doesn't look physically ready. And for a team to all of a sudden be just kind of putting him in pen as, oh, well, this team's relying on Bracco next year to, to be one of their wingers, to be a third-line guy. Like, it just it seems like a little bit of a leap right now, just considering – the foot speed is not crazy, and, you yeah. know, you mentioned in the piece, like, yeah, he's he, – and just right now, you you got to be able to get to those spots and be able to make those plays. And I wonder what you think it will say if, for a guy like that, that has this opportunity 
we're not going to write anyone off at, you know, 21 like you just put out there. But what you can read into for a player who has an opportunity this summer to build himself up a little bit, to work on his skating, to build up his body a little bit, to really hit the gym, be very diligent about adding strength and muscle. If he comes into training camp next year, not really having done either of those things. Yeah, and that's a huge, huge question. And I love that question because it's one the organization has too. Mm -hmm. They want to know, like, how, you know, how serious is this guy? Do they appreciate? Um, and by the way, I'm not taken away from Bracco as a dude at all. He is a widely beloved character. And, um, you know, I've got nothing good things to say about Jeremy Bracco, but his. Is that commitment there in the gym? Does he grasp the magnitude of how close he is? Um, you know, what do you want to be? Because there's tons of players who kind of are quad A players and get a bunch of points in the American League and never quite make the jump. But he's certainly a guy who, if he takes the bull by the horns, could could do something big. Which also, by the way, brings me to a point that you know these long playoff runs for the in the American Hockey League. We've talked about how great they are, and I've written about how important it is for players' development. This is the first year that I'm not sure that it is because a guy like Bracco is similar to, I'm sure someone you guys are going to ask me about, a Sandy and Lilligren, who I believe are healthy senses there. They can skate, they can do all this stuff, but they just need to get stronger. And the longer they're playing every other day and traveling and eating from Gino's Italian eatery or wherever you get your food before you get back on the bus after a, a game, you know, these guys are getting the chance to give their bodies what they need to be the players the Leafs want them to be right now. So I'm not sure if they get eliminated the next few, few days. It's not a good thing. Well, this is why... Uh, okay, again, skill, skill. You want guys with skill, for God's <laughs> sakes. Because I know I'm going to get hammered about this. But, but Muriel, wouldn't some tomato cans be nice? No, not some tomato cans. That's not it at all. And it goes to the same thing with these guys, though. And the guys that they're kind of penning in here is that... I think everyone was kind of in this consensus or a little, little bit of an agreement that what something that the Leafs were missing that they could have kind of added a little bit was not, not like you can always add skill, but that they were looking for a little bit of a heavier team, one that maybe did have a little bit of size. Maybe that was able to kind of hit you in the mouth a little bit more or respond a little bit better sometimes to a physical game. And my one kind of concern with this is not just rushing prospect development and needing your prospects earlier than when they're ready for, because you love having the luxury of being able to keep Sandine and Lilligren and Brocco down in these spots with a really successful organization with a coach who's getting the best out of some of these prospects and in a place where they can flourish a little better than rushing them up here. But that all of a sudden these guys that seem to be around the fringes of next year's Maple Leafs team don't exactly fit that bill. Like it just seems like they are going to get a little bit smaller and, and they're not as skilled as some of the smaller skilled guys on the Maple Leafs. Exactly. Yeah. And that it's kind yeah. of accentuating a bit of a problem that the Leafs already have. Yeah, and I guess that's something that if you want to take a knock at Dubis, one of them might be that if you continually draft for skill, which I believe you should, you know, eventually the system is going to catch up and you'll have guys, you know, ready. But right now they just, they only are developing these sort of skill players. So sometimes they take a little bit longer. And um, yeah, I think we're going to learn a lot about the relationship uh, between Dubis and Babcock the evolution of uh, the two of them um, and how they view player personnel and what decisions they choose to make with these guys. Now, something you'll hear in coaches' offices and front front offices all the time is that you hope the players make the decision for you. Like, there's a chance to die just you don't even have to think about it. He comes into camp and all of a sudden he's, you know, blowing his previous uh, numbers out of the, the water in the gym. But more importantly, he looks like he can handle himself on the ice. He scores some goals and you go, okay. You know, I don't have to make this decision. But I think in reality, it's going to come down to a situation where Babs and Kyle don't want the same player. And, you know, the player who's best for the roster in terms of roster construction and capfriendly.com may not meet who Babs wants it to be. So there's a chance that everything we've talked about with these two comes to a head fairly early next season in terms of which players start the season on the Maple Leafs.